You're listening to the BJJ Globetrotters Pirate Radio Podcast, brought to you from St. Bart in the French West Indies. We talk jiu-jitsu, traveling, and people who do things a bit different in life. I am your host, Christian Grogan. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 11th episode of the BJJ Club Charters Pirate Radio Podcast. I have some great news. I am finally out of the basement. Yes, it's true. It took me 10 episodes, but I made it. Uh, long story short, a few months ago, I had to move uh, to a different apartment. And um, yeah, it's kind of an upgrade. I have no cockroaches and no tiny frogs and no people flushing the toilet um, while I'm recording the podcast. On the other hand, I do have uh, maybe a little bit of echo because the apartment is still kind of empty. I apologize for that. Um, and there might be some music from some construction workers just outside my window. But apart from that, I actually have windows and light and air conditioning. Um, so it's uh, quite an upgrade for uh, for my little podcast project here, I would say. So for this episode, um, I've been kind of busy the last few months since the last episode. I've been... Uh, Moving apartments, obviously, that was kind of a, a big, uh, a big thing. Uh, took a lot of time, and I've also been traveling uh, pretty much all of January. Uh, just did the winter camp in Austria, and uh, after that, I was in Canada for uh, for a few weeks for a holiday. Um, it was cold. I we went there for the for the exotic uh, cold weather, and we got it. We got what we asked for. So. Um, yeah, it was fun. I managed to visit uh, an academy there and teach a little bit, which was uh, really nice. I actually haven't been able to do that for, for years because I've been so busy with the camps. And whenever I travel, it's always for a camp and I want to kind of save my energy for the for the camp. So I haven't managed to visit a lot of uh, places to train. And uh, I thought now I was on holiday, I would, I would kind of take that up again um, because it was something I really enjoyed doing, especially when I... Obviously, when I did my round-the-world trip for, for five months, I, I was in in more than 50 academies and, and I got so much out of it, so many connections and good training. So I managed to drop into a small academy just outside of Toronto and and uh, roll a little bit. It was really nice. So for this episode, I kind of decided I wanted to do it a little bit different than, than usual. I usually have an interview with someone and uh, I have a bunch of interviews lined up, but... I wanted to do uh, something slightly different and uh, and do kind of a, a little kind of a little bit late New Year's uh, recap um, New Year's episode. Uh, so what I thought of, of doing was to just kind of talk about what happened last year at BJJ Club and um, and then do kind of a preview for for uh, for this year for 2019 um, because there's going to be so much going on and uh, I thought it would be interesting to to talk a little bit about the schedule and also. Uh, maybe some of the, the history behind behind some of the many camps we do, because I don't really get to do that very often. And uh, I think there might be a few interesting things uh, there about how, how these camps uh, actually came came to happen, uh, because each one of them have, have kind of a, a history to it. So, so that's what I'm going to do for this this uh, episode. And um, yeah, uh, no, no interview. I'm just going to kind of talk for an hour or so and uh, hope you can enjoy it. So I'll get my notes ready and um, and you can lean back and just uh, enjoy the story of what happened last year and uh, what's going to happen this year. So as usual, uh, we start the year really early with the winter camp and uh, last year we started already January 3rd. So uh, I remember I was flying to Austria on uh, to go there on like New Year's Eve to get there. And um, in January we also... Um, had the, the BGJ Globetrotter of the Year Award, which has become kind of an annual thing. Uh, there are so many people doing like interesting things and, and amazing trips around the world. So uh, I thought it would be a fun little thing to kind of highlight one of them that I think has done something extraordinary. And uh, Robert Barker won the, the award last year for the 2017 award, that is. And uh, there's a podcast episode where I interview him about his trip. Uh, he's been traveling extensively ever since, so you can still kind of follow his blog and, and what he's been doing. Um, one of the big things uh, that, that, we, uh, that we managed to do last year was uh, I, we hired our first full-time employee, 
uh, Vara, who's been working for me when I had an academy in Denmark. She worked for me there for many years. And um, then she moved to Bangkok. I moved to the Caribbean. And uh, Globetrotter started to to kind of grow a lot. I needed a lot of help. And um, I decided to ask her to work for me full time. And uh, so in January, she, she started working and she's doing a lot behind the scenes. Uh, she's pretty much taking care of all spreadsheets, uh, all emails, everything with the shop. And uh, at the moment, she's been doing so many IBJJF forms uh, for people competing. We're helping a lot of people uh, to compete in um, in the IBJJF tournaments. And um, yeah, she's busy. I think for the Europeans, we had a, there were uh, 40 people or something uh, representing BJJ club service. So it's kind of, uh, that, that part is kind of taking off, even though it's been a, a small corner of what we do for a long time, I'd say. Um, and with Vara's help, I managed to free a lot of time for myself to to kind of uh, pull other things off uh, last year. Uh, one of the big projects that I, I had on my mind for 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 a long time was the, the Globetrotters in Action, which is kind of a video library. Um, I've, been, I've been kind of wondering for, for years about how what approach I could take to to kind of the instructional aspect of jiu-jitsu, which was one area that we didn't really cover with club trotters, um, not globally at least. Um, and uh, with Vara working, and I got in touch with more people who are very good at, at video filming and stuff, um, we've managed to set up a system where we, we can film a lot of the, the classes at the camps and put them online. And uh, this has worked really well. At the moment we have... Uh, there's uh, 150 videos of uh, classes from the camps, and uh, they're all, I mean, everything we've filmed since we started uh, is uh, high quality professional videos, um, like any instructional you would pay for. Um, it's all free, and I think it's, uh, it's a really good, like, karma project. I'm very happy to be able to share uh, so much from the, from the camps with people who can't maybe afford to go or don't have the time. Um, and... As of today, we have 167,000 views on the on the channel, which I think is uh, quite impressive for for uh, not even one year. It, I think we launched it in March or something, so uh, where it's it's growing really fast, and um, and I see how uh, how the instructors of the camps managed to reach uh, an entirely new audience. So it worked exactly as I as I hoped it would, and and we uh, already booked. Uh, cameramen for for many of the camps this year to uh, to film and put it on online. So if you want to, if you went to a camp, you want to rewatch something, or you you didn't go to a camp, you want to watch some of the classes, you can go to bjjclubtourist.com slash inaction. Um, there's also an, an, another URL called bjjclubtourist.com slash two guys one mat, uh, which was the highest voted URL in the in the Facebook group. So whichever of those you prefer, you can you can use that to access it. Uh, also in March, um, another thing that, that kind of came out of me having more, more time in my hand, hands uh, organizing the camp with the VARA behind the scenes is, um, is we started having uh, kind of workshops, conferences, talks at the camps. Um, at the US camp, we have a big kind of uh, theater that we thought we would use for something. So I asked some of the instructors, hey, do you want to do maybe some some workshops or talk about something that, you, that you're good at that's not necessarily uh, on the mats? And uh, we managed to put together a, a pretty good little kind of schedule for that. And um, this has really grown for from the camps. We, we've booked um, conference rooms for, for most of the camps and uh, managed to, to have like a full week schedule of workshops uh, everything from competition preparation to like meditation. I do a workshop on on how to get ideas and make things happen. Uh, something that's been really interesting for me to, to kind of develop. And um, and we have um, workshops on like first aid if, or like first response if if uh, if someone gets injured. And uh, it's been it's been really interesting to have this kind of off the mat schedule as well. And I think uh, a lot of People has been sharing some interesting things. Uh, we also um, ask the participants of the camp if anyone has something really interesting they want to share. That we can put it on a schedule. And we had like uh, we had a workshop on beer brewing at the Sen camp. That was that was kind of interesting and also history of, of grappling. Uh, some some really interesting stuff. So the workshops are, are something that I'll definitely keep doing, uh, setting up at the camps, and uh, and I think uh, there's a lot of potential uh, for that. Uh, a little bit later in the year, around May, I think we we uh, had our first camp in a castle, 
Uh, I just wanted to rent a castle just for the sake of renting a castle uh, because it was an interesting challenge. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, when we talk about the 2019 camps. But that was really uh, interesting. It was kind of a new thing uh, for us and uh, it worked out really well. So we're, we're going back this year. We also had the first camp ever in Iceland. Um, Iceland is a place that I, I, I feel like I have a lot of connection to. Um, so I was really happy to... Uh, to go back there and set up a camp that was a huge success. Um, and uh, just before the Iceland camp, we had a warm-up camp in Greenland, just because, just because, you know, I mean, if you go to Iceland, you might as well also go to Greenland. So we had 20 people so in Greenland for like four days. It was kind of wild to do that as a warm-up for the Iceland camp, but it was also really, really fun. Um, I have a friend who trained with me in Copenhagen and he, uh, he moved, he's from Greenland, he moved back home to, to work. He set up like a, a dentist business and, um, and he's try, trying really hard to start up jujitsu there and it's, 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 it's uphill for him, uh, but it's going pretty well. And, uh, and I, I promised him I would, I would come in and help him out and bring some friends. So I thought, hey, let's, uh, let's set up a little camp and 20 people signed up, it was a free camp. So I just wanted to bring sparring partners for, for the little club there. I think they only have like five people training. Um, so we, we set up a free camp in Greenland. Uh, I mean, all you had to do was get there, which is complicated and expensive enough. But that was really, really interesting. And um, yeah, I, I'm not sure we're going to do it every year. Well, obviously we're not because I'm not going to do it this year. But it's definitely a place that we'll, we'll try to return to now and then. And if nothing else, I would say that um, we had the flight with a small propeller from, from Greenland to Iceland. And it was probably uh, the most scenic flight I ever had in my life. It was absolutely stunning with the, with the, I mean, Greenland is so vast. It's, it's hard to comprehend how big that place is. And, uh, and I've never seen icebergs like that from, I mean, it was a low flying propeller. So the visibility was really good. And even, even if the camp completely tanked and failed, I think that, that flight alone would have made it completely worth it. So yeah, definitely, definitely recommend visiting Greenland at some point. Uh, I just shoot me an email if you want to get in touch with Jason, who who runs a little academy there. Um, it's an inter interesting place, and it's it's like feels like really like you're at the end of the world. There's like nothing there. It's the most isolated place I've ever been. So, so that was fun, and um, and we went straight to Iceland and had a camp there with 200 participants plus all the locals in the biggest MMA gym in the world. So, quite a busy summer there. Uh, of course, it didn't stop there because just like a few weeks later, not even two weeks later, we had the uh, we hosted the annual kind of mecca camp in Belgium, um, which uh, was the fourth year in a row we went there, and uh, it was as epic as ever. Um, it's one of the biggest mat spaces we have available for the camps, and we had 270 people there. It sold out in in like less than a month, I think, six months early. Yeah, we we set a, a kind of a limit of. 250, 70 in, in that location. Um, but that's a really, really intense week. That's like the biggest camp we, we do. Uh, I believe there were almost 200 people on the waiting list. So to, to, uh, for, for a cancellation ticket. So it was quite wild and I, I always enjoy going back to Belgium. Um, we decided not to do it this year, but I'll, I'll get back, get back to that a little bit later when I talk about, uh, 2019. Uh, shortly after, and this was, as you can probably imagine, this was kind of a busy summer for me. We did a lot of European camps over the summer and I, uh, I stayed in Denmark and just traveled to the camps from there. So I didn't have to go, uh, go across the Atlantic from the Caribbean for every camp. But just a few weeks later, we did the, the big fall camp in, uh, Heidelberg in Germany, which is a really pretty city. Um, and we've been going there for a few years and, um, it just kind of gets bigger and bigger. And uh, the facilities are really nice. It's the, the Olympic Training Center of, uh, of Germany. And um, I think the main thing that happened at this camp, there was a lot of stuff going on, but the kind of the, the biggest thing we, we managed to pull off with it was that we pulled off like a pretty much a full scale wedding. Um, there was a couple who met, each, met at the camps and um, they got engaged and posted like a picture on Facebook about the engagement and and I, I was kind of joking when I, I commented on the picture and said, hey, you should, uh, I should get ordained. I should become a minister and, and, and we can have a, a wedding at the camp. And their immediate response was, okay, let's do it. So uh, this was like 12 days before the camp, maybe, that we decided to, <laughs> to go for it. Uh, luckily, I have a lot of people who are very helpful and really love to, uh, 
to make crazy things happen at the camp. So with a small group of like five, six people, we pretty much managed to pull off uh, like a full wedding at the camp. So the last day of of, uh, of the fall camp, we had like an outdoor wedding. Uh, I became ordained with the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Master. So I was a priest, obviously. Um, and uh, it was really nice. It actually felt like a real wedding. We had a, a big party afterwards, which was a four hour open mat with live music and free beer and champagne and cake. Um, and it really felt like a like an actual, like I was at an actual wedding. I guess it was an actual wedding. I mean, except for maybe the paperwork, but just like with IBJJF, you can get promoted and then later you're going to have to go make friends with someone else to, to have your paperwork signed. So it's kind of the same. Um, so it was very kind of in theme with that, I think. Uh, it was a great experience, really. You can you can look up the, the pictures online. Um, it was very professional. I was I was very happy with everyone helping out, and everyone pretty much went all in. And we set up a full scale wedding in ten days. Um, yeah, so that was something we haven't done before. I'm not sure we're going to do it again, but let's see. If anyone out there wants to get married at a camp, we can probably make it happen. Just message me. Shortly after that, we had. Uh, I took a few decisions um, because things were growing, and I want to do more stuff, but I don't. But I don't have have enough time on my hands, so. Um, if you've ever been to a camp, you know Katla, she's been uh, the assistant as, at the last 20 camps or something. Um, and she, at some point, had decided, uh, she, well, we did a camp in Copenhagen, it was maybe two years, two and a half years ago. And she messaged me, she just moved to Copenhagen, it's like a student, I say, I, I don't have, I have no money, and can I can I help out with the camp or something? Uh, and I'm like, sure, just come and help out. And I find out that she's very good at uh, camp logistics um so she started helping at more camps at some point i just said okay just now you just come to every single camp so she did every single camp for the last uh almost two years or a year and a half or something um while she was studying uh unfortunately she finished her studies and uh, was looking for a job and i was like no i don't think it's a good idea you, have, you get a job because then you can't travel uh, 11 times a year for the camps so um we figured something out and Catalyst is now working uh, part-time for Globetrotters and she has another part-time job. Um, so she's also doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes, more like creative uh, part of, of camp planning, coming up with ideas and like looking for, uh, for places to rent and cool accommodation for people and kind of planning parties and stuff. But she's doing a lot of work behind the scenes and this is really has really, really kind of... Uh, up the the camp experience for everyone i think especially next especially in this season 2019 the, we're going to do so many new things because i i have her uh working uh every day pretty much on um on improving the camp experiences for everyone um so she's got a lot of of good ideas and, and a lot of stuff uh where we're kind of executing that i would never have time for myself um in kind of the same same kind of theme there there's this guy stevie young guy from from Sweden, who's been going to a few camps. And um, he turns out to be like a really talented videographer and photographer. Um, and the same kind of happened. I see that in the, in the near future, he's going to get a, a job somewhere um, full time and he's he's going to become really good at, at what he's doing. Uh, he did some, some kind of short highlight videos from the camps and I think they're really impressive and he's like, super, super ambitious and driven about what he's doing and, and pretty much working nonstop. Um, so I had this idea for a long, long time. This was actually the reason why I had even owned this this microphone I'm speaking into right now is that I wanted to do kind of a, like a Globetrotters kind of documentary, like a story of of what is Globetrotters and... and and it, it at, one, at one point I wanted to write a book. I thought that was a bad idea. Then I thought I'll, I'll make like one podcast or something is a bad idea. Then I thought I'm going to do like a video with, with like pictures and me talking kind of didn't work out, you know, and years passed and suddenly I run into Stevie and I'm like, uh, and I also actually talked to another videographer at some point, maybe like maybe four or five years ago. I said, Hey, do you want to, do you want to do all the camps and do some video and stuff? And like, he couldn't commit to it. And uh, then I ran into Stevie. He's got nothing to do, really. I mean, he's he wants to travel. He's like he's really good at what he's doing. And and I'm like shit. Before this guy gets a job, this might be my, my option. So so I proposed to him. Let's 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 bring you to every single camp next year and do like a documentary on, on Globetrotters. Um, 
pretty much like we're going to do full cinematic documentary of everything going on behind the scenes, like follow follow the camps, follow me uh, doing the camps from, from New Year to New Year, pretty much. Um, so he was all up for it. And I think uh, this is a very interesting project. It's going to be really expensive. Um, but I think um, I look at it as, as kind of creating a piece of art you know, for the for the time after Globetrotters or, or whatever, uh, or at least for, for my, for my children to watch at some point. Uh, it, I think it could be like a, a defining piece of art of Globetrotters, just like writing a book was, was like, took an incredible effort. And I think this, this could be kind of the same thing. I want, I want to document this, this very special time of, of my life. And obviously for, for a lot of people who, who are very involved in the camps, um, so, so we're going to pull off like a full scale cinematic documentary on Globetrotters and, and we're talking every single drone you can possibly imagine, all, all the best equipment. Stevie's got it all and, and he loves to, to like um, make things look really, really good. He's also going to do like short like promo videos for every camp. So you, you might see the, the first one, the winter camp promo coming out soon. Um, so we plan to film for the entire year. We already pretty much have plane tickets for him for, for every single camp this year. And uh, once that's done, there's going to be a lot of editing. And um, we hope to rent a, a movie theater or something similar in uh, at one of the big summer camps in 2020 and have like a full scale premiere. So you better get your suit or your, your pretty dress ready. Uh, we're going all in on this. So, so we're going to have... Uh, uh, like a grand premiere of the Club Tourist documentary. And, and we're going to try to involve as many people as possible in it, like uh, have people introduce themselves or do like short interviews uh, at the camps. So if you're going to the camps there this year, there's a very good chance you're going to be in the documentary somehow. As we kind of wrapped up the this last year's seasons of camp, the camps, then I, I, I could really kind of uh, put in the last piece of effort to to uh, confirm the last the camps for 2019 and and I always try to announce them as early as possible. I know people many people need to plan way ahead of time to to be able to go. So this time I actually managed to to announce a lot of the camps already in in October and November. They saw really really quick. We had uh, we had a new camp in Portugal in another castle, which was the first one to sell out in 17 hours. I think that's definitely a um, a record for us. But uh, that's going to be interesting. Um, we also had a few new new things happening. Like the in the last part of the year, we uh, we did for the camps like a camp achievements list. This was an idea that came up in the at the at the summer. Uh, sorry, the fall camp in Heidelberg. I was talking to one of the instructors, Jeff, and we said you should have like an achievements list on the website where you can you can kind of see who who did what at the camps. I think it started out with trying to deadlift Bruno, which who was like 115 kilos deadlift him or get married at camp it's like a checklist so if you go to btjglobetrotters.com slash achievements um you can see some of the things it's it's kind of a silly little corner of of, of the of the camps but i think it's it's good entertainment and uh and there, there are some really really stupid things there um at some point we also realized that club trotters might be the the biggest jiu-jitsu affiliation personal jiu-jitsu affiliation in the world i'm not sure but I mean, I just counted, randomly counted one day, and it's like more than 600 affiliated academies. I think we're at 650 now or something. It's growing really fast. Um, so I thought, hey, we should do like a family portrait, you know, like a cheesy uh, kind of Christmas portrait. Uh, it didn't really end up with that, but we, we managed to to design like a poster with uh, group photos and pictures of our members from around the world. There's like 350 pictures on that or something, if I remember it right. Uh, it's online. You can download it high res for free, or you can order some prints at, at cost price if you want it. Um, I think that was a fun little new things thing to do, and we're definitely going to do that again next year. Our uh, our Facebook group members of BJJ Club Tour has also reached like fifteen thousand members, so I think that's uh, that's a pretty good milestone, and it's it's super active. Like people use it every day to find to find travel uh, partners and uh, gyms to visit, and make connections. I think. That's kind of a, 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 a very important uh, backbone of, of uh, Globetrotters community, the, the Facebook group. I recommend you, you join it if you're not in it yet. Um, so that's pretty, much, that's pretty much what happened last year. Um, it, was, it was kind of a busy year, but I think 2019 is going to be even crazier if it's even possible. I'm not sure, but we're definitely going to do our best. So what I thought I would do would be like 
primarily talk about the the camps next year because they all kind of have a story to how they happened or or something special about many of them. So so I I, I want to just kind of preview the the 2019 camp um, calendar because uh, it's also going to be the busiest year with 11 camps in a year. Uh, I think the most, I think it was 10 last year or nine. And then, yeah, this is definitely the, definitely the uh, busiest year we've ever done. I, it's like, I, I have so many ideas on, on my list of camps. And uh, I mean, just for this season alone, I had 57, I think, or 60 uh, potential locations I, I could do a camp. And um, and those were the ones that I really liked, that I, that I kind of wanted to do. On top of that, I have all the camps from last year, which were 10 years, 10, 10 camps. And it's like, I don't really feel like canceling any of it because, you know, I really liked every single one of them and I want to go back. But if I want to squeeze in anything new, I, I would have to cancel something. So, I mean, obviously I can't do 70 camps a year. That's impossible. So out of the 60, I think I added like three, three from the list and I had to cancel one or two. Uh, the ones we're not doing this year is uh, Greenland, uh, just because it's complicated, really expensive. Uh, and it's, it's a place I, I think I'll go there like now and then. Every other year, every few years, we'll go visit Greenland as a kind of a special thing. It's a special place. I, I don't want to get to feel like I'm getting too much of it. The other one, which was kind of controversial, that I, I chose to, uh, to cancel this year, or at least skip, uh, is the Belgium camp, which is, has been our biggest camp uh, for years, and uh, it usually sells out in no time. But I kind of have to stay true to to my uh, to my philosophy of how I want to do the camps. The, the camps are supposed to be my holiday. I, I mean, I, that's at least my approach to it. If if I really, really, if I'm if I'm if I'm super passionate about going somewhere, I think the camp is going to work. If I'm like, meh, been there, done that, kind of, then I don't think it's. I don't think it's going to work the camp because it, I mean, the vibe kind of comes uh, from me often. You know? So, so every camp is pretty much based on like gut feeling. How do I feel about going somewhere? If I'm really excited about going there, I'll do it. If I'm just even slightly not excited about it, then I will definitely consider canceling. It. Like I did, we did Copenhagen for many years. Copenhagen was the was where we started all the camps, and uh, and that's. And, and I mean, it was like kind of like the the HQ of the camps. But at some point, I was like, okay, I I, I don't feel like doing it anymore. I, I we've, we've done it all. I can't I can't make myself excited about it enough. Uh, so I decided to skip that. And um, same thing kind of happened for Belgium this year, like fifty fifty excitement and something else logistics, um, because we've done it for four years and I really really enjoy it. But then I sit and look at the list of places I could go and I'm like, do I want to go back to Belgium for the 50 in a row or do I want to do like two other new places I haven't been before? Um, so eventually I, and it was a really difficult decision for me, uh, very difficult to uh, to not do it this year uh, because I mean, it's easy just to repeat things, you know, it's, it's, it's the same with traveling. You go somewhere and you're like, wow, this is new and great. And then it's like, that becomes that becomes the, the place to you go all the time. And then what was new and great just becomes like where you go all the time. And, and, and then to, to kind of break out of that and experience something new is, is really difficult. Like the first time I traveled on my own was to the U S um, when I was young, 20, 21 or something. It was like, wow, this is something very new for me, very exciting. But then I went there every year for like six, seven years and and I didn't even consider going anywhere else in the world. And suddenly I, I, I managed to get to Asia and I'm like, this is great. And then I stopped going to the US. But it, it kind of takes some takes some effort and, and, and some courage to kind of break out of, of what you've always done. And it's no different than, you know, you're always at home. You, you don't go traveling. Then suddenly you go traveling. It's really difficult. And But but to break out of, of routines is really difficult. But I thought it's, it's, it's a good exercise, like quit, quitting a job. You know, quitting a job is... It's a good exercise, I would say. Uh, it's it's very very hard, but once you're out on the other side, you you might see that it was the right thing to do. Um, I quit my job a few times, like made some big decisions, and it was always worth it. It's always one door closed, another door opens. So in some way, I I thought Belgium has been really it's been great. We've done it for four years in a row. I really want to go back, but should I do the same thing five years in a row? Uh, and I think what are globetrotters if you're not globetrotting? You know. Um, kind of have to travel that's kind of the point of it 
uh, I don't think Globetrotters should just be in the same place all the time. Uh, it just doesn't kind of fit with the idea of it. So I was like, okay, I uh, looked at it. If I cancel uh, Bel- Belgium this year, I can actually do three new camps instead, like three other locations that I haven't done before. Uh, so that was a, that was a trade-off, and um, I'm very happy with the decision. I mean, Belgium is going nowhere. We can always do that camp again at some point. As soon as, as I feel in my stomach, it would be exciting to do it again, then I'll, I'll take it back up. Um, but I actually managed to squeeze in three other camps because of uh, cancelling this one and Greenland. So that was the decision. If you don't know how the camp started, I'll give you a quick quick story about that because now we're going to go through uh, all the camps planned this year. And it might sound like something really big, which it kind of is, but it all started uh, really pretty small and simple, um, like many things. You know, if, if you look at like a big company or something, you say like, you can never do that. But then you, you hear the story and you realize like Nike was just started with one guy selling shoes out of his car, you know. And um, Club Show started with, with uh, like the camp started, it wasn't like I sat down and said, okay, um, now I'm going to start doing jiu-jitsu camps 10 times a year. Uh, it never started like that. It was like I did I did my round the world trip and I visited like so many people and I stayed on a lot of couches. And every academy and every couch I, I, I was in or at or on, uh, I invited people to come visit me in Copenhagen. And um, as kind of a thank you for the help, uh, please come visit me if you want. I'll, I'll take you, show you around. Copenhagen is an easy place to visit because there's a lot of connections there and like it's fairly cheap to fly and and it kind of backfired because everyone came to visit all the time. <laughs> we kind of when I came back from my trip, I had guests almost every single week uh, coming to visit me, and I was like nonstop tour guiding, taking people out, uh, you know. Um, and at some point, I was like, I mean, it was great, but at some point, I was like, why don't you all come come the same week? Because this is uh, I never have time for anything. And, um, yeah, we had like 25 people coming to visit in one week. Uh, all of them were someone that I kind of, uh, met during my, my travels. And I think there were maybe two or three, four people more that, that we kind of managed to invite from outside. We, we, we said, let's make a poster and say, we do like a training camp for a week. And there were like, I, I remember there were a couple from Finland and like uh, very few people showed up for this. Um, and we invited some some instructors that were friends of ours. And then we just kind of said, okay, we'll have a week of just a lot of training and and we'll probably go to dinner every night. We'll probably have a party. And uh, realized, hey, this was actually really fun. You know, let's do that again. And we did it again the next summer. And then our academy grew and more people were interested in coming in. And it kind of grew from there. And just small steps. And I think the second one, we had like 45 or 50 people and then 70 and then it became like an annual thing to have like a summer camp in my gym and then a fall camp and um it was very training heavy but the social aspect kind of developed a lot too and and parallel to this globetrotters kind of happened um globetrotters just happened because we were trying to sign up for the europeans uh, 2012 or something 2013 and we couldn't use the name of our academy because uh, there was already someone else called csa um, so I was like, oh, fuck, what, what, what name do I use? And I was like, okay, let's just use BJJ Globetrotters because I just came home from my trip and my blog was called the BJJ Globetrotter. So I guess the, the team of guys I was, I was coaching was the BJJ Globetrotters. And um, um, we had a team of like 14, 15 people going to this, this competition in Portugal, registered it and just like, hey, we should make some patches. And, uh, and I, I kind of drew... Uh, a, like a sketch, like a draft of the of the patch with the bus, and uh, my friend who was the designer asked him to to do it, and and then we printed some patches, and suddenly uh, there were other people who couldn't register for the Europeans because IBJJF is complicated sometimes, and it's like sure, just just register with the club chart, it's no problem, and um, and the, the, the snowball just started rolling from there, and and uh, then it was like okay, I made a little bit of money from the patches, I don't want to you know pay taxes of, of the income, which is like nothing, but it was more, it was more complicated to, to, uh, to pay taxes off and then just use it for something else. So I thought I'll, I'll use, I'll reinvest the money. And then we made some, some rash guards, some shorts, and, um, it kind of slowly, you know, took shape from there. And parallel to that were the camps in my, my academy in Copenhagen. And I said, let me, put, let's put the Globetrotter stamp on this and, and see what happens. And then it slowly took off from there. Um, and it, in the beginning, it was only camps in 
in Copenhagen. The first one we ever did outside of, of Copenhagen was that a guy called Louis, he read my book. He was in El Salvador. He's like, hey, I'm in El Salvador. I have this private house. It's really nice. Why don't we, I have no one to train with. Uh, do you do you want to come over? Uh, maybe come for a holiday. I maybe, I see you like to surf a little bit. You can surf right here just, just outside of the house. And um, it's literally like pretty much on the beach. And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, that would be fun. But uh, I have no idea how to, uh, you know, make that happen really so i thought hey why don't i try to invite some friends over and we we did like a rough budget of if we have some people over for a week with like food and surfing lessons and stuff and um then i said hey let's i, I should call this a camp you know just like we do a camp in copenhagen this could be like a beach camp uh, because it's on a beach it's not in copenhagen and that was how the first camp happened and and that was El Salvador. we did that, did that four years in a row uh it was a two-week camp it was like two one week camps. And I think first year we had like 15, 16 people. And that was, uh, that was a very special experience. It's, uh, we ended it, uh, I ended it when, when I moved to St. Bart's because uh, first of all, two weeks uh, is kind of a long time for me to leave. Uh, with traveling, it's like two and a half, almost three weeks away. Um, and, uh, and, and it also kind of feels a little bit like the Caribbean island camp. It's like exotic beach surfing, you know, so, and it's much easier for me to do a camp here. So that, that's why I ended it. Uh, but it was like four years. I was, we did eight weeks of camps in El Salvador, which was uh, an, an amazing experience. I made so many good friends there and uh, I hope definitely I'll, I'll be able to go back one day. But that was the first time we ever did anything outside of, uh, of Denmark. And when I, I had announced this uh, El Salvador camp, I thought, hey, um, what else do I want to do? You know, and and I was, I was really really much not much doing much. You know, when I had the the academy in Copenhagen, we had like more than forty employees. There was a lot of people, and I wasn't really doing anything but just like training and teaching. And it's like I I miss traveling. You know, I, I just came home from around the world trip, and I really missed you know doing things and making things happen. It was like I felt like traveling around the world was like really doing something with my life and and I wanted to, to do more of that and now I was just home and pretty much doing nothing I was traveling pretty often still for for teaching but it was like I didn't kind of create anything you know and I I, I really missed creating something uh in my life and uh, I thought okay I'd always wanted to go go skiing snowboarding again because I did that once when I was like 11 years old and I really loved it but I never managed to do it again and uh, I was randomly thinking about this um, as some guy who, uh, who like, he saw the camp in El Salvador, I think, or he, he kind of followed the club tourists and he said, hey, I live in Austria. Maybe one day if you want help with anything, I can kind of help you out. Uh, I'm a snowboard instructor. And I'm like, ding, great. Let's, let's see what we can do. That would be great. And I just uh, betted everything on, uh, on trying to find a place. And he helped me out a lot. Uh, Valentin, who's been involved in all of the all of the the winter camps and um yeah he he looked at a lot of places we managed to find a place it's really difficult by the way to rent um a place for a lot of people in in like the the alps in the high season of, of skiing and snowboarding because everything is booked with uh, with groups uh but we managed to find this small hotel in radstad um which was <laughs> it was quite an experience this was you, you must understand this was the first camp I ever kind of did. Uh, I mean, El Salvador was one thing because because that was like a private house and these people were used to having guests and, and we kind of worked it out together. But this was the first camp I, I made from scratch. Uh, the other ones in Copenhagen were easy. We had we had the facilities, we just kind of invited people to come and train. Um, but the winter camp was the first one we did from scratch. And, and I was like, yes, I really want to go snowboarding. So let's see, just like I really wanted to go surfing and I managed to to invite some people to join there and uh, help to make that happen. Uh, I wanted to go snowboarding too. So I thought, okay, let's, let's try it out. And we found this place, we booked it. And I think it was like a, it was like a three, three nights or something. Uh, it was super intense. It was really short. Uh, and we charged almost nothing for it just to see if we can get some people. And I think like 70, 65 people, something showed up. And, and uh, that was the first, like, I would say real camp I tried to do. It was winter camp. 2015 probably let me think no 2014 winter camp 2014 in january or february or something i don't remember 
14, 15, 16, 17, 18. It must be 15. Winter camp 2015. Wait, I have to look this up. So let me look at the camp page here because I think I have winter camp. What year is this? Winter camp 2015 was the first one. And um, yeah, around 65, 70 people. And it was, uh, I mean, it was really fun. Really, really fun. I think at this point I had no clue, like, I mean, a little bit. We did a, f a few handful of camps in Copenhagen, maybe five camps in Copenhagen before this. But that was easy. I had receptionists and everything. And here I just kind of showed up and thought, I'm going to go snowboarding all weekend. And then people can kind of train, I guess. And it was a, it was a train wreck. It was like <laughs> it was the craziest camp by far of all of the camps. Because one, we, we had kind of borrowed mats. We had like half a, um, agreements with like three different small judo clubs in different towns around around the, the area of the camp and we kind of had to oh we'll just go pick up the mats on the way and that took like fucking hours and hours and it was so much work to carry these big tatami mats uh from three two or three different academies it was horrible and then we came to the place and the staff there was just like super rude and and they really did not want to help us at all we were supposed to have laundry service and they're like Oh yeah, but you gotta figure that out. As something like there was only one washing machine and it didn't work, or something. It was, it was terrible. We had to wash our geese just in the shower. I remember I was just stepping on my gi every day in the shower with shampoo. And and then we we're like, okay, we have the mats there. We put them out. And then we're like, no, no, there's also some school groups who need to do some gymnastics in the middle of everything. And and uh, it it was such a train wreck. And we we just decided, okay, we're just gonna party every night and and pretty much not sleep. And uh, I had someone to help me out, um, but we we had no clue what we're doing. Like it was it was an absolute disaster behind the scenes. I think people had like a pretty good good experience there. I mean, it was really fun. You know, we we had a lot of training, a lot of drinking, uh, a lot of snowboarding, and we managed to pull off like all the classes and the open mats. But then suddenly, like on the last day, we were like, oh yeah, by the way, um, there's no one to move the mats. Uh, so I was, I think I was alone there and we had to, I had to put all the mats by myself in the, in the van and then drive them to like small judo clubs and, and put them back out in the judo clubs. And I was like, I hadn't slept for three days. It was a nightmare. Luckily I found like three people from Holland who helped me out. I, I paid them, I bribed them in, in like geese and everything I could find. And like, you get all of this if you help me, because I thought I was going to die. I literally, literally slept like one hour for three nights. It's not that long ago, you know, it's like only four years ago. But looking back, I, f I feel like, what was I, like a teenager or something? I, I had no clue what I was doing. I just had like no control over my body. I was so excited to go traveling again and experience things. And maybe I, I, it was like a slight crisis from coming home from a around the world trip. And I, I wanted to feel that kind of wild traveling sensation again. And I was like, let's go all in on this and just like wing it, see what happens. And I mean, there were no big catastrophes other than people just not sleeping and like uh, tr t training drunk. And uh, but 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 it was it was a great experience. I must say, it was really fun. And um, the year after, we 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 we've managed to find a new location. Um, I had kind of uh, you know that that place we went to the first year. They they were really like rude. They were not very service oriented. They they couldn't care less about us being there really. And uh, and I was like, oh, that place is pretty bad. And, and um, let's try to look for something else. And they were also booked like every week. Uh, so we couldn't get it. And there was like, let, let's look for another place. And we, we spent almost six months researching for, for a new location for the, for the winter camp. And everything was booked. It was impossible. And of course, also you have to find a place, the right size, the right location, and with some kind of training hall where we can put out mats. And we found one place that was really nice, um, great location, and they had some mats already, um, and that they had a sports hall in the hotel. It was like, couldn't be better, but it was all booked. And I was like, okay, well, I actually gave up on the winter camp. I was like, that was fun, but we're not going to do it again. It's simply like, I literally thought I was going to have a heart attack on the, on the last day of that camp, Monday, when I was supposed to go home. Um, it was, it was that wild. And, and I thought, I can't do that again. It's like, I'm going to kill myself if I do another winter camp. And this, we didn't find anything that was even available. So I gave up. And then I think like two or three months later, I, I kind of look at the, the I, I want to do some camps again and had some ideas. And I just emailed these, these, uh, the management at that place we'd been looking at. 
and like just in case anything pops up i said and and she was really quick to reply and say yeah we actually have a group that cancels so if you want to if you want to take their spot uh, you can get in and uh, i was like yes let's do it and uh, so we booked everything and this place was much nicer and that's that's where i've just where i just came back from a few weeks ago uh we've been there three years in a row now and uh the management is really nice and friendly that's a good good start and they have uh like a sports hall just downstairs from in inside of the hotel actually uh, i've been looking at, at renting a sports hall like around the corner but around the corner in in the winter of the alps that's like you have to walk through a lot of snow and in, in wet geese and it doesn't work out even though we could put much more mats there a much bigger mat space i don't want to do it i think uh i think i also like the intimacy of the winter camp it's kind of like it's like really small and you 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 come back from skiing snowboarding and and you walk in and you're like uh, really cold fingers and you can go to your room and take a shower and just walk just downstairs and have dinner and get on the mats and roll and, and the mats are kind of small relatively small to other camps we do uh, and they're crowded but but it's it's really like and it's there's like a, a mist in in that room because the air outside is so cold we open the windows and then when that hits the kind of the warm the warm sweat from from a hundred people's training is like rolling in a in a cloud sometimes and I think kind of the kind of the 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 intimate experience of the camp or, or like it's it's very intimate it's, it's very intense the camp is very intense and I kind of like that you know I, I don't want it to be in any other way the winter camp is supposed to be intense maybe not as intense as, as the first year we did it back in 2015 but but the experience is supposed to be intense and, and I really like that it's and it's four nights uh five days so it's kind of a short camp too and and it's like non-stop uh non-stop things going on get up in the morning some people go there only for training and some people go there pretty much only for for skiing snowboarding lessons and uh some people go there only for the party, really. I had one guy, a friend of mine, who I invited to come along maybe two two camps ago. And, like, he didn't manage to ski once. I think he did, like, one open mat. He, he, but he but he, he, he went out a lot. And, and he said, like, his his goal with the camp, his, his measurement of success was to just build a snowman. And he didn't even manage to do that. It was like, but, but he worked really hard for me as a, I hired him as a reverse bouncer at the nightclub. Uh, so whenever someone from the camp tried to go home, he would like pull them back in and buy them shots. Yeah, the winter camp has been kind of wild, and but it's, it's kind of uh, gone down a little bit. It's not that crazy anymore, I think. Uh, depending on, of course, what people want to do. Some people want to want to want it to be the wildest weekend of their life, and some people just want to kind of ski a little bit and roll a little bit. And and that's I, I like that about the camps. You can kind of do what you want. You can design your own experience. I mean, there's there's no expectations that you have to train all the time. There's definitely no expectations that you have to like party at all if you don't want to. Or um, so people come for different for different experiences. And um, the winter camp is is uh, is great and and it's one of the prettiest places I've ever been in the world. It's definitely the the Alps and uh, and so we just did that camp like three three four weeks ago. And uh, it was probably the best one we did. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was because um, maybe it was because there was so much snow. Like we had like a crazy snowstorm. And uh, this this year we also managed to build like a, a, a snow bar. We had on the last day we built like a bar outside and had a bonfire and we had like glue vine and it was really nice. It was a very good experience. And there was so much snow. I've never seen anything like it. We and on the last morning we had to spend hours to dig out the car. So. But it was really fun. It was like everyone. I think everyone was really uh, shaken together from 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 the experience and and the intensity of that camp. And um, as always with this, um, like this hotel, it has like groups that's been coming every week, um, like every year for for a certain week for the last thirty years or something. So it's really difficult to book. But uh, I I I immediately obviously put put down the deposit for for the following year. So so the winter camp is happening. Uh, 2020 and it's going to be January 2nd um a little bit close to new year but a lot of people then go to to uh, Munich or Salzburg and uh, and celebrate new years there and then go to to the winter camp uh 2 days later and um yeah I'm definitely I just came back from it and I'm already excited to go back so the next camp on the on the schedule for 2019 is the Caribbean Island camp which is actually starting Kind of today, I mean, I have to pick up some people today. The camp officially starts on Monday, 
but a lot of people arrive, like especially Sunday, uh, a lot of people arrive and um, so they come in a day or two before, or stay a few days after the camp to kind of hang out and and also experience the island outside of uh, of the camp, which is a very, very high paced schedule. This camp kind of came came by because um, I wrote the book, The BJJ Club Charter, many years ago now, actually, it's 2012, I think. And a guy here who's now my friend, he, he read it, invited me over, uh, he emailed me uh, and said like, uh, hey, I live uh, I live in St. Bart's. And I'm like, where's St. Bart? I have no idea. I live in St. Bart's and, um, and uh, we have almost no one to train with. You want to come over and teach a little bit for a few weeks? And I'm like, where, where, where's St. Bart's? I have no idea. And I look it up on a map. It's like, oh, that's the Caribbean. Yes, I'm going. Um, and so I went here for two, two and a half weeks to teach uh, jiu-jitsu to a small group um, back in 2013 something. Really liked it. Then parallel, I started to do the camps. And um, and then I think the year after or something, they just built uh, like some accommodation here for, for visiting athletes because the island is like the average uh, price for a night on the Airbnb is 1,000 euros. So it's really, really difficult to, to visit this place. Um, and, and whenever there's like football teams coming in or something, they have nowhere to stay. So, so um, the local kind of little government, they built uh, some really, really nice accommodation um, for visiting athletes that, that we could use. Um, and I thought, hey, let's let's try it out. I was I was starting to do the camps, but doing camp here would would be like a big thing. I mean, that that would be a big bet. I would I would risk a lot to do it. So I did like a test camp and just invited some friends. I think we were 12, 12 guys here for a week, uh, just training and um, yeah, driving around the island, going to the beaches, surfing. And I was like, this was a lot of fun. Let's actually try to. And then I started to consider maybe I should do it as an actual camp. But it took like a year or so or a year and a half before I was confident doing it because the camps kind of grew slowly at that, that time. I, I, at that point, I'd only just done um, Copenhagen camps, really. Um, and I think I just kind of started planning the winter camp and the El Salvador one. But but to do something in in the Caribbean would be like a really, really big step for me. Very, uh, like very risky. But with time, I, I started to feel ready for it. And then uh, we tried to do a first camp here, and it was, it was really fun. We uh, now, especially now, getting to know a lot of people on the island, and I have a big, big network. It's very easy for me to to design a, a really good week of experiences here for everyone. Um, we have uh, some of my friends are surf instructors. They do surf lessons every morning. Uh, I know I know a lot of people who, who own like restaurants, and we eat there every night. Obviously, there's a lot of training. And uh, we rent boats to uh, to do like boat trip on uh, around the island on the last day. We even did one of the camps during the carnival, which was kind of wild. And I'm not going to do it again. Um, I think because it was just it was just too wild, uh, and the island is just too full of tourists that week. So I, it was it was fun, but but I think I'm going to put the camp outside of the carnival for now. Everything is like twice the price that week. Um, because there are so many tourists, so so um, so the camp uh, this this week or next week, sorry, is um, just a regular week here. There's there's not much going on on the island, and uh, you know, we have a full schedule. Every morning there's a there's a surf lesson, uh, then we have a bit of jujitsu, then we have a beach trip. We we go to a new beach every day, back for more jujitsu, then go to a new restaurant every night for dinner. Um, then we have like, uh, as I said, sailing trip on Saturday. We, we take out, out all Saturday of the, um, all of Saturday out of the calendar pretty much and, and just do a, a boat trip. And in the evening, we're going to have dinner on the beach with some live music. Um, a friend of mine is, uh, is playing, uh, playing music in many of the, the bars here and, and she's going to come to the beach with a little setup and, and play like an intimate concert for us, which we did once. And it was, it was a really good experience. So the camp here is, is, it's kind of my home camp and I really enjoy doing it. We do it twice a year because it's fairly easy for me to set up. Uh, it's it's also a small camp, one of the smaller camps with just like 45 people, uh, plus the locals and the local club here is, is growing. Um, I think at this point we have maybe like 20, 20 adults training, which is very good. I mean, uh, it's it's a very good group. And, and I also do the camp for them because it's very isolated to... Uh, train on a tiny island in the Caribbean. It's not, it's not like we have uh, competitions or other academies where we can go visit. Uh, we're pretty much just us, like this small group. So from the perspective of also being uh, the co-chair, uh, 
I find it very important to bring in some uh, some new people to roll with, and it's really valuable for the for the team for sure. Anyway, so that camp is just around the corner, and uh, we're going to do it again in November. Um, still room for that one, as far as I remember. After the Caribbean Island camp, I actually have kind of a little break. Um, I have almost two months, more than two months of, of uh, no camps, which is uh, kind of rare for me in the, in the year. Um, it's not like I'm, I'm going to do nothing. There's going to be plenty of stuff to uh, to prepare for the for the season of camps and uh, all the other stuff that we do. So the next camp coming up after after this little break is going to be the Castle Camp in Italy. Um, the Castle Camp ha- kind of has a history. Um, I I have this little idea book I wrote many years ago, maybe seven eight years ago, and I know one of the things I wrote was just rent a castle. And it's just been on my mind ever since. I just really wanted to rent a castle for no other particular reason that I just wanted to be able to say I once rented a castle. So seven, eight years ago, it was pretty much impossible, or it was definitely impossible for me to rent a castle. Um, but now with the camps growing and everything, uh, I, I kind of took that idea up again, and I and I thought, hey, maybe this is the time to try and do something different. So I, uh, I spent... Uh, more than half a year at least researching castles um we did this beautiful beautiful spreadsheets with more than as far as i remember like 130 castles that we looked into uh all over the world pretty much and uh it's probably one of the biggest research uh jobs we've ever done um so i've been calling up i spent like months and months calling up uh literally more than 100 castles around europe mainly um, to, t- to try and find just the right place. And and out of the 130 something, we boiled it down to just like three or maybe four that was that could could do, could work uh, for a camp because to rent a castle for a camp is kind of difficult. You have to find the exact right size of the castle. It can't be too small. I mean, many, many castles are either huge with like room for hundreds of people and they use them for weddings and like big events, which would not work for, for our, what we do. Uh, or they're kind of, I mean, even if it's like a family castle with, let's say, seven, eight, nine rooms, it's still too small. You can't do a camp for just 10 people. Um, so I found this that was like the perfect size. Uh, it's like 20 rooms. It's in like in the middle of the countryside in Italy, beautiful in between like hills and out in nature. It's like two hours north of Rome, so it's really accessible. And um, the owners there are really nice and very, very easy to work with, which is a big plus, of course. Um, the place is absolutely beautiful. It's like a 1,300-year-old monastery. So you can argue if it's an actual castle or not, but it's old and it looks like a castle. Uh, and uh, it has it has its own kind of uh, church from the 8th century or something. It's like super old. Um, the place is just amazing and, and they, they renovated everything, like every room is like super nice and the, the owner, um, the wife of, of the, the couple there is, uh, is like an interior designer and, and it's, the place is just stunning. So I took the chance on that and from, from a pure business perspective, it was definitely not like a very good move, but from the perspective of just being able to say I rented a castle, then it was uh, by far the, the best thing I've ever done. So we pulled that off for the first time last year. Um, we got mats that we put out. Uh, we have two two uh, locations to put the mats on the castle. One is out on the on kind of the the terrace with a, an amazing like panoramic view of the hills around us. And when it's raining, which it it was a little bit last year for for two of the days, um, we put the we put the mats inside of the church, which was kind of like a an oh shit plan B kind of thing, but it turned out to be pretty cool. So um, rolling in the church with like candlelights everywhere was uh, was a very special experience. Um, so when I booked it for the first time, I thought oh, maybe this is going to be a, a one-off thing because uh, it's kind of really expensive to book a castle. Uh, it doesn't make much business sense, but it was such a good experience. And I thought this this has to be part of the camp kind of of the camp season, just because I like contrast in traveling and I, I need contrast in the camps. Um, so I want to do these uh, very different camps and this is definitely different. Um, so we're going back and uh, I also purchased mats for the for the castle last year. So the mats are there, so we might as well go back. And uh, this one sold out in, I don't know, 24 hours or something this time. So 
it's a popular one. Uh, the participants there, uh, since it's kind of a VIP camp, the participants there also get two free tickets for other European summer camps that year. So it's going to be nice. It's, it's kind of nice to uh, to have this small group of 20 people at the castle and then uh, get to know each other really well, and since it's a very small camp, and then see them again uh, during the summer. Usually I run into them in like Iceland, Germany, Austria, something. Um, so socially, it's also a different camp than the others. Um, very interesting. And uh, speaking of contrast, um, I always wanted to do like a contrast camp where we did like two very different locations at the same camp. I'm not sure it would ever kind of work out, but it's it's been on my mind for a while. Uh, it's kind of manifesting itself a little bit in, in this this week because going directly from the castle in Italy, uh, we're going to fly the, the camp ends Sunday and then we fly directly to uh, Tallinn in Estonia. Uh, arrive there at midnight, Sunday midnight, and then get some sleep. And then Monday, Monday morning, we just start right over again with a with a new camp, um, a full week in after the first ever spring camp in Estonia. I've been going a lot to Estonia actually. Um, I was once invited to teach at a camp there. I don't even know when it was. It must have been ten years ago or something, uh, if not more. Estonia is really nice. It's it's. Uh, I knew nothing about it really. I mean. It's part of the old Soviet Union, so you maybe knowing nothing about it, that's what you think it is. But it was actually a very Scandinavian and felt very like homely, felt very much like going to to Sweden, northern Sweden in the summer. Um, really loved the place, came back every year. Um, kind of uh, always wanted to do something there, but there's been a lot of established stuff going on and I didn't want to, you know, move in and compete with something that's that's already there. I don't think that would be fair at all to do to do the same camp as, as someone else is doing. But the idea kind of resurfaced as uh, as I reconnected with um, with one of the instructors from Estonia, Preet, who has been going to a lot of camps the last two years or a year and a half. I learned a lot from, from this guy and a lot of the other Estonians uh, going there for, for camps for, I think I went there like four or five years, at least every summer. I uh, got a lot of inspiration for my jiu-jitsu back in the days and also had a few of them over to teach at my place in Copenhagen. Um, so I kind of reconnected with Prit at some point and said, hey, why did, why did you come by for the camps? And um, that turned out really well. So he's been teaching at, uh, at a lot of camps, I think almost every single camp for the last year and a half or something. Um, he's also running a highly successful academy in uh, Tallinn. Uh, which they just expanded to like this huge, huge place just outside of Tallinn. Um, there's like a tram going from the city center and it's like less than 10 minutes, so it's easy to get there. Uh, the place is enormous. It's probably the biggest mat space I've seen in a gym. Um, yeah, probably everywhere, I guess. I don't know. It's really big. So when I was, it, it just kind of automatically was put on my idea list since there's a lot of mats and I really like Estonia. So um, that kind of worked out. We, we experimented with doing like the first kind of spring camp early in just before the summer because there's a lot going on in the summer, especially in Europe. So uh, we try and set that up. And um, I went there to check it out earlier, like early last year, just after the winter camp. And uh, the place is really nice. I haven't been to Tallinn for many years, but it's really easy to get there from most places in Europe. And it's, it's relatively cheap compared to most of Europe. Um, so it's just a really fun place to visit. Um, and uh, I was excited to go back to Tallinn because uh, I've, I had so many good memories. I have so many good memories from the summers there. And um, I, this was just an excuse for me to go back to Estonia in the summer, really. <laughs> um, so we set up the camp and um, and it, it's, it's sold out at this point. Uh, so we're going to be 200 people plus uh, the locals. Um, and uh, I'm really excited for, uh, for this because it's kind of a different... Uh, I mean, it's a city camp, which we don't do many of, but... Uh, it's kind of a different city than um, than we've done before. It's like super medieval and it's very price competitive. So um, we can do a lot of fun things there. I'm, I'm very excited for the for the dinners we're going to plan and all the activities and the, the party, obviously. I have a few people uh, just dedicated to planning the pub crawl and the party there. Um, my assistant Katla is going to fly over to Tallinn within a few weeks and uh, go and check out things for... Uh, for, for the week to to start planning already and the mats are going to be packed there that's going to be a big camp um so that's going to be exciting uh first ever in estonia and uh i'm really excited to go back to estonia um 
it's beautiful there in the summer. I mean, it's May, so we, we don't really know how the weather is going to be, but it's probably, uh, as usual with the camps, we're lucky. So I assume it's going to be great. Um, so that's it. And um, shortly after after this camp, only like two and a half weeks later, we go back to the U.S. for the for the fifth time or something for the U.S. camp. Um, and the U.S. camp was was um, when when I when I started doing the camps, uh, I was like, I, I've been I've been traveling a lot to uh, to the U.S. for for training when I was really young. It was like the first first places we went for I ever went for training on my own. So back in 2000, 2001, I went to Portland, Oregon to learn jiu-jitsu. I, I had only been, we'd only been headlocking each other at that point pretty much. Uh, so I was, I had to seek out jiu-jitsu. So, so I went over there and, um, and I came, I, I came to train, I came to the U.S. to train every year for like seven, eight years, trained a lot in New York and Florida. Um, really liked it. Um, I, I kind of, uh, evolved a lot there in terms of like language and just uh, maturing. I was like 20 or 21 years old. But there was a point where I hadn't been there for a long time. And I thought, man, I, I want to try and go back to the US. As, as you can hear now, these camps are pretty much just me kind of trying to plan what I want to do. <laughs> I was like, I want to go back to Estonia. We'll do a camp in Estonia. And uh, I want to go back to the US at some point. Uh, so I had to kind of come up with a, a, a way of doing it. You know, um, and I thought, I don't want to do like a city camp because the, the cities in the U.S. are really difficult. They're always really spread out. And uh, for the social aspect of the camp, that's kind of difficult to pull off. Uh, even in like Copenhagen, which is a small city, um, people don't run into each other a lot, like other than a training. So I try as much as possible to uh, to do camps where people are, are kind of together for the social aspect. But I think there's room for definitely room for, for several city camps during the year. Um, but I wanted to do something different in the U.S. for sure. I also, uh, I grew up in a, in a small town outside of Copenhagen, kind of just in the forest. And uh, I spent a lot of time in the forest as a kid, and I, I really missed that. At, at this point, uh, I'd been living in Copenhagen for, for 10 years, and I rarely got to see the, the forest and the kind of smell the the, the spring, and uh, I really missed that. So... I thought I got I got to get to the U.S. and I got to and I got to get that feeling of being in the forest, like kind of camping, bonfires again. I really miss that. So that that kind of uh, I, and I think I randomly saw like one of these summer camps for kids, and um, and that just looked super cool. I was like, why did I do that as a kid? So I started looking into it, and I I, I went through a lot of these places. It was very difficult to find the right place, and and this was also one of the earlier camps. Uh, this was 2015, so I probably planned this in 2014. Uh, so this was really early in in the Globetrotters camp history um, that I I tried to pull this off, and um, I did find several places um, that I wanted to go, but ended up ended up uh, just betting everything on the, this place in New Hampshire, which was uh, pretty cool. I mean, it was a little bit worn down; it was very rust uh, rustic, but. It looked good, and I just said, "Okay, let's try it. I gotta try this." So um, I had no idea if it would work or not, but it did, and we—I managed to sell 100 tickets. I had no idea how. So I flew to the U.S. I remember uh, this was the very first camp. My friend picked me up in the airport, and we drove there, and it was really late. I think we arrived like 3 a.m. in the middle of the night, the, the night before the camp, and it was raining, and it was thunderstorms, and it was just crazy weather. And we arrived there, and there was, there was everyone was asleep, and they said, "Just find a cabin and, and find a place to sleep." And we walked in there, and there was like mud flowing everywhere, and it was in the middle of the forest, and it was super dark. There was no light, uh, only from the car, and like we had a little flashlight on our phones. And we walked there, and it was just like crazy windy and and like raining, and I was like, "Shit, what is this place?" And we find these little cabins down by the, the beach. They're kind of a beach tour in front of us on the lake. And I clearly remember this. I walked into the first one and turned on the light. And and it just hit me like my heart just stopped. You know, that sm when you walked in, I got that smell of like summer camp as a kid. It was like the wooden cabin. And it smelled a little bit of like pee, you know. Some kids had, had, had probably pissed themselves in sleep and their mattresses. And the beds were small, and it was like quirky, and like, uh, and I, I just thought, what on earth have I done? Like, what have I done? There's a hundred people coming tomorrow morning, 
and this place is like this is for kids and it's it's like falling apart it smells like like it's kind of rotten it smells a little bit like piss and uh, what on earth have i done like uh and it was just pouring down outside this was one of the very first camps uh 2015 so it must have been like the first year i really started to do something outside of Copenhagen and El Salvador and I was like I tried to sleep that night and I was so nervous I just couldn't sleep my heart was was pumping it's like 100 people gonna show up tomorrow they're gonna hate me and just like turn around and go back home and I managed to fall asleep and I walked out the next morning and it was beautiful clear sky the sun was shining the birds were singing and like the, the kind of warm wind hit me in the face and uh and I could just smell the forest, the spring of the forest. And that moment I knew this is going to be a ride. This is going to be very, very good. Because, I, I mean, what I wanted to do, what I want to do is with as many camps as possible is to put people out of their comfort zone a little bit. Um, so that was why I didn't do like a nice city camp with hotels anyway. So now we're there in the middle of the forest. And I was definitely out of my comfort zone there for for a minute or for a night. But when I when I got out there that morning and... And I just sat down on the bench and I looked over the lake and it was beautiful. And I took out my laptop and started to prepare like the, the participants list for the arrivals. And suddenly I kind of, you know, I kind of got into it. And, uh, and then I felt that, that this was going to be fine, you know, even though it was really out of my comfort zone. And I knew that when people arrived, they would probably experience the same. Like they would be, whoa, what is this? And that was exactly what happened. Um, you know, the, the training hall was completely open to the forest. It was pretty much like training in the forest, which was uh, really cool. But um, but also um, there were spiders, you know, and in the showers there were a lot of spiders and uh, and there were a lot of kids that slept on those those beds we had. They were very small and a lot of stuff were written on the walls and on, <laughs> underneath the bunk beds. Um, and I think everyone was really out of their comfort zone there for when they arrived and but you know after one or two days if we kind of got into it and it was like okay we're all dirty there's mud everywhere you know we smell like like bonfire and we like we go swim in the lake and we train all the time and everybody kind of got into it and 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 we just kind of found this rhythm together 100 people and that's when i realized this this will work you know i, I can actually put people out of their comfort zone together uh, and and it'll kind of be a special experience because i think for you to have, uh, I think that there's definitely a recipe for like a kind of quote unquote time of your life experience, like something you look back at and, and say like, this was something special, this was a special experience. And one of the, the biggest ingredients is hands down is uh, it has to be difficult. Or if you do something that's easy, you, you won't remember it in the same way. So there must be an element of struggle uh, for you to, to, to remember something as something that was really valuable for you in life. Um, and the struggle here can be like go out of your comfort zone. It can be training like crazy amounts. It can also be like being really drunk together, um, or going crazy places or climbing a mountain. I don't know. But here it's like definitely okay. Okay, I showered with spiders and uh, I was super dirty for like five days, but it works and uh, and that really worked and that that gave me the confidence to do more stuff like that. That was like really outside of people com people's comfort zone and my own my own comfort zone for sure. Uh, because remember the camps are just for me, pretty much. <laughs> so we did the U.S. camp in New Hampshire twice. Randomly, uh, I, I had an option to upgrade to another place uh, in Maine, which is where we are now. We're going back there for the for the third time this year, and um, this is such a nice place. It's like it's just an upgrade on every aspect of the old place. Like the food is better, the place is better, the location is better, the quality of the buildings are better, the beds are better, everything is just nicer. And we have a lot of mat space. We're bringing in like three full wrestling mats. Uh, so we can comfortably fit 250 people there. We're not going to book that many people, but we could if we wanted to. Um, so so that's going to be a really nice camp. There's a all-you-can-eat lobster night. We have like a comedy night with stand-up comedians um, which are like people from the camp, but it's really fun. Like we have a full theater uh, to do that, where we do workshops as well. And um, there's just everything going on that you can imagine on a on a summer camp, you know, in the forest. And the Wi-Fi is terrible. It might be, it may or may not be sabotaged by someone. That may or may not be me. Um, but um, in there is a little bit of Wi-Fi somewhere. But the connection is horrible. Um, 
And it's really interesting to put like 150 adults in the forest with almost no internet for for five days. Like something special happens with that. And uh, it's really nice. We do bonfires every night. And everything you can imagine, like doing in the forest in the summer, you know, we get we get paddle boards and kayaks, and uh, it's uh, it's such a good experience. And uh, I feel like people really get close to each other when they when they're in the forest, completely disconnected, far away from the city. Um, so that's definitely a, a camp that I'm looking forward to do again and again and again. Now, um, at some point when I when I realized that okay, I managed to pull off renting a castle. The immediate thought was like, oh shit, how am I going to top this next year? Like, how can I possibly top renting a castle? And eventually the solution was obvious. Uh, I had to rent two castles. So I went for the second one on my list, on the big research list, um, which was in Portugal. And uh, the one reason why I didn't really go all in on that early was that they didn't really have nice pictures, you know, and it was kind of difficult to get in touch with them on email. The pictures were amateurish and I couldn't really get an idea of the place, so I didn't want to bet everything on it. But I happened to be in Europe with a few days to, to spare um, early last year. And um, so I was like, I called them up and said, I'm going to come by and check out your place. And they're like, okay. So I flew down to Portugal for one day and I walked into this <laughs> this castle <laughs> from the 13th century it's like a big square, like just a huge square castle in the middle of the countryside, but still only like 45 minutes from Porto. Um, so I walk in there and I'm like, what? The, this, this place is amazing. It's like, it's so beautiful. And um, it's like, wh why don't you take some proper pictures? They're like, oh, we didn't have time. And it's like, you should have told me like this place is amazing. I would have rendered it like just on the spot for sure. I was like right there that in that one day I was there for like an hour or two, had a meeting with them. It's like, okay, I'm going to do this for sure. Uh, there's no way around it. I just have to, to try this out. And, um, so we have two, I'm renting two castles this, this year. Um, and, uh, it's kind of similar to the Italy concept thing. And, uh, since both of them sold out in 24 hours, it was, it made sense to, to have two castles for sure. Maybe I should do three next year. Who knows? Um, it's really cool. It's like, it's it's very medieval. It's like way more medieval than than the Italian castle for sure. It's just like five minutes outside of this beautiful old town in Portugal, um, and ten minutes from the beach. So, what what I what I really wanted for this this kind of castle camp was like a small group, lots of great food, lots of wine, and lots of training, of course. Um, and uh, I think it's going to work out. We got this private chef coming in as on this at this castle as well to do cooking for us every day and um, we're going to do like murder mystery games and it's just going to be fun to be at the castle and again the participants here get two free tickets for for the the camps of the summer so I'm going to run into them again again in uh, some of the other camps yeah so I was really glad I had a few days to spare otherwise I would have never found this place I would have never gone to see it the next uh, camp we do after that which is pretty much um, oh it's, now I'm looking at the calendar and I realized how on earth did I book this? Because I'm going to have to go to Portugal and back to the Caribbean. And then only 10 days later, go back to Europe for the for the next camp. But OK, it is what it is. I'll get some frequent flyer miles for sure. So the next camp is is, is the winter camp, but in the summer. Um, I was in, in Europe last summer and uh, uh, was looking for somewhere to go. And... Um, the the manager and the owners of the, of the place we do the winter camp always say, oh, please come in the summer to visit. It's so nice here. And uh, that was that was my chance. I've been invited every year. Um, never managed to go. But last summer, I actually managed to go and stayed there for two two weeks in the summer um, with the kids and the family. And it was just amazing. It was such a beautiful place. And um, so different from the winter camp. It's like two completely different worlds. And I didn't go there with, with like that in mind to, to do a camp there. But um, I was there in the summer. It's like, oh, damn, I have to come back next summer. This is just too much fun. Um, the nature there is is so so pretty. Um, the, the ski slopes, they obviously you can't ski, but you can ride mountain bikes down them. And they have like, um, they build like playgrounds. The biggest playground, playground areas I've seen probably ever uh, was on top of these mountains uh, in the summer. So I was there for two weeks and um, had such a good time. And I talked to the manager, say, hey, why don't I come back next year and, 
and uh, we'll try to set up a camp in the summer just to see kind of how it goes. Um, it could be like the first ever kind of family friendly BCJ Club Traders camp. So she was all in on it. And uh, we also purchased brand new mats for the winter camp there. So I said, okay, we have the mats. We might as well use them for twice a year instead of once a year. So we, um, we tried it and uh, I paid the deposit right there. Um, booked the whole place, the entire hotel, so it's not going to be anyone else. Um, and I think it's so such a like a family friendly place to visit in the summer that uh, I that was I, I usually I actually never wanted to do like family jiu-jitsu camps. Uh, still don't really want to do it, but this is such a cool place for people with kids. So I'm going to go there with my kids. I'm pretty sure I'm going to bring them for this one and only camp, um, just because it's a uh, it's a great place. The, the playgrounds are just uh, amazing there is the kind of water world right next door which is outdoor open outdoors in the summer with water slides and uh, it's so much fun so and since we have the entire hotel and plenty of space and plenty of rooms um, I decided to kind of open this up for families with with kids and uh, it's still going to be like a regular camp and the the families are going to have their own kind of um, floor at the hotel so we won't have kids running everywhere and and, uh, making a lot of noise and there's going to be uh, a kids class a day, like an open kind of playtime. There's a lot of, 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 of play, things to play with in the training hall. But apart from that, it's going to be a regular camp for, for adults uh, with training all day long. And um, if you're into like hiking or nature or you know, like to you like to uh, see like some really cool lakes or just want to visit the Alps in the summer, this is a great opportunity. Uh, personally, I'm probably going to do mountain biking quite a lot. Um, there's a huge mountain bike park on one of the one of the mountains there, which I usually snowboard down uh, in the in the winter. But I'm pretty excited about um, mountain biking there for sure because uh, it's just the, the, it's probably probably the prettiest place I've I've been. I would say. And at this point, uh, I think like 60 people signed up, so that's actually very good. I, I expect it to be a small camp uh, for sure. Um, and uh, it's going to be interesting to do it as a kind of a family camp for the for the first time. Um, I'm excited about that because many people, many, many, many people go to the camp and say, you got to do something where I can bring my family. So this is the one. So <laughs> we'll give it a shot. And um, as I said, so far, uh, 60 people signed up and I would expect it's probably be like 100 people. So it's very, very quiet there in the summer. There's like no, no one there and the hotel is empty. So it's not like in the winter where it's just crowded. Because when we do the winter camp there, it's like in the high, high season and the town is full of people. But here it's going to be super, super quiet, like a uh, full on like sound of music experience. Um, so, yeah, can't wait for that. Shortly after, like uh, two weeks after that, on uh, July 15th, mid-July, uh, we're doing the Iceland camp again. I always felt like I had a really strong connection to Iceland. Uh, maybe there's a, obviously it's kind of a cultural connection. It used to be part of Denmark, like a historical connection. But a lot of Icelandic People when they when they they, they they want to start studying, they move to Denmark to study, and uh, many go to Copenhagen to study, and then they come and came and trained in my gym in Copenhagen if they ever did jiu-jitsu. So uh, and then whenever they f- were finished studying, they usually have kids, and then they go back to Iceland. So there's been like a, this constant stream. I had I had this academy in Copenhagen for 15 years. Um, there's been this constant stream of people coming from Iceland and then going back again. So I have. A, a, countless of friends uh, f- from this little island in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, and I've been there a few times and I really like it. I always feel some kind of special connection with the place. Um, and um, again, it was it was just a place I wanted to go back. You know, I just wanted to go back and, and kind of reconnect with it and, and see all my friends there. And uh, having a lot of, of, of friends now living there also made everything easier. So you have probably seen online the pictures of the Mjolnir gym, the, the biggest MMA gym in the world, and it's kind of carved out of, out of a cliff. Um, it's it's pretty badass. It's like full-on bat cave uh, jiu-jitsu gym. Maybe one of the, the most impressive uh, gyms I've seen ever in the world. Probably, it probably is, definitely. So I tried actually for several years to kind of, you know, talk to them about it, and they were moving, and it didn't kind of work out. And, and eventually... Um, Eventually, I, I kind of got through to it because I, I've been wanting to do a camp there for, for a long time. Uh, I think it's such a unique uh, destination and definitely a place where it's kind of like most people want to go to Iceland at some point. Um, so I'll just give them a great excuse to go with the jiu-jitsu camp and make everything a little bit easier and cheaper. 
So I managed to book this place and we went last year and it was just such a blast. Um, Iceland in itself is, uh, is a really fascinating country. The nature is, is out of this world. It's pretty much like being on a different planet. You just rent a car and drive in any direction and it's like you're on, on a new planet. It was a very big success. I was kind of not sure if I was going to do it again like, uh, or it would be like a one-off thing because uh, it's expensive to go to Iceland, like uh, no doubt about it. It's not. It's, it's usually on people's like bucket list, like I got to go to Iceland and see the nature there. And uh, once you've done it and you realize, oh, but damn, that was expensive. I'm probably not going to do that again and again every year. So I thought, mm, can we do it like every year? I'm not sure. But, you know, um, last year was so much fun. I enjoyed it so much that I was like, there's no way I cannot do this again. Also, the weather, the summer weather last year was horrible, like absolutely horrible, really cold and rainy. So it can only get better, the weather. So I was like, there was at least one place where I have like 100% sure, uh, almost 100% sure that, that that aspect of, of the camp is going to be better, the weather this time. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a training heavy camp. We, we have at this camp like three mat spaces running nonstop with classes um, simultaneously. So there's like a gi, a room with a gi class and a room with a no gi class and a room for like yoga, mobility, like workshops. And then we have this bar this viking bar area where we have workshops during the day uh speeches and like um yeah it's really the facilities are, are great uh, i definitely recommend you go you go check out the the mjolnir uh, video and check out their facilities it's so cool we also have uh i like to do a few throw in a few like different classes at the camps and this one it was obvious to have like glima the icelandic wrestling uh Class. So we, we were going to do um, kind of a lesson on that on, on the last day of the camp, like a workshop with a little competition. And the day before the camp, we were just walking, me and a guy called Sean, we walked outside the gym and just around the corner, there's this place and it looks like straight up like a Viking temple carved out of, out of the mountain. Like just like as you stepped into Lord of the Rings or something, it's like, oh my God, we're going to have to use this for something. So started calling some people and within like no time we had set up uh, Viking versus intruders, Vikings versus intruders, uh, Glima competition there with mats and music and everything. So that was on for the last day of the camp and it was quite something. Uh, it was probably one of the coolest uh, experiences I've had at any camp because since I was a kid and I, I watched Bloodsport pretty much every day as a kid, uh, I always wanted to participate in the Kumite. Uh, so at the, at the Iceland camp, we were just blasting the Kumite soundtrack as uh, these poor little camp participants were, were doing Icelandic wrestling versus like Icelandic giant Vikings. Um, it was highly entertaining. We're definitely doing that again, like no doubt about it. That was one of the coolest things we've ever, we've ever done. Uh, also, the party was like straight up insane because we had this uh, Viking bar and um, yeah, the BGJ Clock Turtles bar team did a great job of instigating the party. So that was uh, definitely something that, that night. So going back to Iceland in middle of July and um, just a week later, I'll, I'll head back to Denmark and uh, spend a week there. And uh, then we're off to the biggest camp of the year, which is going to be the, the summer camp in Heidelberg, Germany. And it is the third time we're going to Heidelberg, but the first time we do it as the kind of the summer camp. Um, it's also the 50th camp of uh, BGJ Club Charter. So it's kind of a milestone. Um, and uh, this is going to be a big one, like a really big one. It's probably going to be the biggest of the year. Um, I would be surprised if it isn't. Uh, it's one of the few camps that's still not sold out. I think at this point, uh, there's like 70 tickets left or something. Um, we're going to be close to 300 at that camp for sure. Heidelberg is a beautiful, beautiful place. It's uh, I imagine it's how most of Germany looked uh, before it got bombed into oblivion at the World War II. Uh, unfortunately, it's uh, yeah, it's one of the most beautiful cities in Germany for sure. And um, we've managed to book this uh, this sports center, Olympic Sports Center, um, just outside of the town. It's like a short bicycle ride, and uh, or you can take the bus there. And most some people stay in the sports hall. Some people stay in the old town. Some people kind of stay in between and. Uh, it's really easy to get around there and it's just like overall like a super super nice place to visit in the summer lots of uh, history and culture and like sightseeing there's a really cool castle there to check out and uh, and it's just a really really big camp like a a huge one it's really training heavy um but this is the one where we have everything it's pretty much the belgium camp just 
in Germany. And uh, I'm really excited to have, have it finally like in the middle of the summer because we usually have this as kind of the fall camp, end of August. Uh, but this year we moved to the middle of the summer uh, to try something new and to make room for something new in the schedule. So I'm definitely excited about that one. Um, it's such an intense week and uh, it's a place we've been a few times before. So, so we have, and we have great connections there. Lots of globetrotters are living there who help, who help us out. And we can definitely uh, do some magic in terms of like things we're going to arrange with, with dinners and tours and pop crawls and uh, things outside of the, the training camp. Um, at this camp, we might also have, I'm just going to call it now because it's, it may or may not happen. But if I say it, they better do it. Uh, a group has been working hard on, uh, on setting up a live band for the open mat. So a bunch of people who has been going to a lot of camps uh, are, are, are working on like um, setting up a live band and playing for the final open mat. So that's going to be exciting. I promise to play the drums on one track only because I really don't have time to, uh, to practice for, for like a full set, a full open mat. And I also need to roll and, and of course drink beer, which is what, what you do at the the final open mat at this camp because we get free beer at the final open mats. So that's going to be exciting. I'm not sure there's going to be a wedding this year at this camp in Heidelberg, but who knows? I mean, if you're out there, you want to get married, I can hook you up probably. <laughs> so that, that ends like in August 3rd and that kind of concludes a, a wild, wild uh, few months. Uh, if I'm just kind of looking at it here, it's like from May, May, June, July, Oh, this is in three months. I'm going to be doing five camps. Well, that's going to be busy, but um, I kind of like intensity. You know, I, I like when it's when it's a little bit wild, and then afterwards you're like, whoa. As I said, there must be a struggle for for this to be a great memory. There must be a struggle, and uh, that is one struggle for sure to pull off five major major camps in in uh, three months. Um, so that's going to be a lot of fun. And if I come out on the other side, uh, I have uh, two months, two and a half months break uh, before the Sen camp in uh, Poland. Um, this is a very special one. I, I don't even know who, who it was who, who let me onto it, but someone, I just remember someone sent me a link, check this out. And I open it and it's like, is that a Japanese village in the middle of the forest, in the middle of nowhere in Poland? Like, oh, I guess it is. That looks amazing. And uh, it's it's so unlikely, like that this place exists. I mean, it's it's not supposed to exist, and it's not like your budget Japanese village, and like it's it's built like super high quality, really nice houses. Everything is like really like well done, and uh, every house has like a fireplace, sliding doors, sleeping on like futons on the on the floor, and the dojo is just humongous it's enormous enormous the biggest mat space we have of any camp by far um it's like on the top of a hill overlooking the forest of a national park and i was thinking why does this exist it's it's not this this can't be this can't be real um and i'm like okay i called him up and uh i'm gonna send someone to check it out because i was in the caribbean so i have a friend in warsaw uh, who's been to a few camps? And I, I messaged him. I was like, "Hey, do you want to do you want to go down to the countryside for a few for for like one day and just check something out for me?" He's like, "Sure." And he jumps in his car and drives like three hours south of, of Warsaw. And I would rate like I would make my decision to do the camp based on his excitement from one to ten. And his excitement was eleven. He was like, "Christian, I never wanted to leave this place." And he took like a million pictures for me. And that that was when I said, "Okay, we're gonna have to do this. I have to book this place." Uh, so we tried it out and, uh, my idea with it was that it's going to be middle of October. So it'll be like rough, like fall kind of, you know, rainy and, and like orange. And we're going to be in the forest, rock around like samurais with our wooden swords. And, uh, that was the experience I aimed for, but it was like full on summer. It was like super warm, super green. And, um, it was, it was, it was great. Uh, it's it really is the Sen camp, like it's super Sen. Uh, it's it's in really in the middle of nowhere in the Polish uh, countryside, and uh, it's in the forest. Like um, so, you just take a few steps out of the property, and you're literally in the forest and can get lost. And I definitely almost got lost a few times there. There's a sauna. We we have like a professional sauna guy coming down from Denmark to do uh, to do like sauna sessions, which was wildly popular. There's a uh, it's like a jacuzzi with uh, 
on the up by the dojo with a with a complete panoramic view of the forest, and uh, it's just like a super luxury camp, which it was like I would never expect to do like a super luxurious Japanese themed camp in uh, Poland. But that's what we do, and this is the third time we're going back, and uh, I think at this point half the tickets, or like 60 out of 100 tickets are sold. That is something special. For, that's like, that's, that's, I can't even explain how, how different that, that place is. Um, we install a lot of hammocks around the property and uh, in between the trees, and uh, I just see nonstop people in hammocks just relaxing, and it's such a relaxing experience. It's like my recharge week of the year. Um, it's also known as sober camp because that's the one camp where we don't really have any parties. Um, not that everybody drinks at all camps, but this is the one where it's like, it's just like recover kind of mind and body for, for five days. And, uh, if I could, and this is what everybody said, if we could, we would stay there for like a month or two, just live there. Um, that would be kind of expensive in terms of ticket price. But, uh, if I could, I would definitely stay there for for weeks and weeks on end. It's just so relaxing. It's like completely, uh, that's a place where I just want to turn off my phone and uh, and just like lift off what I can, berries I can collect in the forest. <laughs> we also do do a mushroom collecting workshop uh, at, at this camp, which is really interesting. Meet like super early in the morning, go walk in the forest and we have someone help us pick out the mushrooms and then in the kitchen, uh, make some food with it for those who want to try and eat it. Um, of course, everybody triple checks that we don't kill anyone and get the wrong by getting the wrong mushrooms. But that's an interesting experience. After that, it's just back to the Caribbean, rest a little bit, and uh, and then I'm back at the Caribbean island camp in November. So it's it's kind of a wild um, wild year again. It's eleven camps in one year, which I think is uh, probably the the most we've we've done in a year ever. Um, but I'm excited about it, and uh, it looks like it's going to be busy because uh, almost all of the camps are sold out already. So I'll be spending my time not trying to convince people to go, but instead uh, just spending my time on preparing everything. I mean, we're already working hard on every single camp of the year, pretty much, to uh, to prepare things and plan like activities and constantly like thinking how can we improve every every aspect of the camp. And um, we try to listen a lot to to feedback and. I mean, I like positive feedback, of course, but I, I assume people have a great experience. And I, I'm more interested in hearing about what can we improve, how can we do it better next time. So uh, a lot of the things that we implement to to improve the camps are, are like just ideas that people came up with or like suggestions they had or stuff they wanted to, they thought could, could be improved. So um, so that's pretty much what, we, what we're working on like right now is to improve every camp as much as we can for, for this year. There's also a lot of work with, with like designing banners, and we do the we do the the discounted geese camp camp geese uh, special design camp geese for every camp, and uh, there's a lot of work with this. So, so it's not like I'm going to do nothing, um, but um, I'm also mentally kind of preparing myself for for the season of uh, of madness, especially the five camps in three months. It's going to be a little bit wild, and um, and I'm re- already we're pretty much working on. The 2020 season, uh, there's a few ideas on the table that I kind of slowly start to think about and call a few people, but it's still very early. Um, but as uh, every year, we have to try and beat the the, la- the year before it, so I better get started, and uh, that's what I'm going to do right now. So um, that was the preview of the 2020 camp season. I'm looking forward to see a lot of you there. Um, I know many of you can't make it for different reasons, which is completely understandable. But this year, as far as I can count, it's going to be like 1,500 people. So I'll definitely see a few of you who are listening to this right now at the camps. And um, as always, I'm, I try to socialize as much as possible at the camps because I really like to get to know people. Like uh, 1,500 a year is kind of difficult, but... But I always try, and you never know, whoever you, you sit down and talk to or you run into, you never know how they might have some idea or do something cool, something interesting, might inspire you for something. So I really try to keep them in mind. So if in case you're going to any of the camps, please please come and say hi or catch me for a roll or, or ask me to buy your beer or something. I'd be happy to do that. So that's it. This episode um, was a little bit longer than I imagined, but... Uh, it was kind of fun to do something different, uh, just talk about the camps. I feel like there is a lot to tell. 
um, that I usually only tell people in kind of like uh, little bites. Uh, so this was the whole story of the of the camps and, and the last year and what's going to happen this year. And um, I'll be back with another episode not in not too long, uh, which is going to be back to the interview kind of uh, type episodes. I have I have some interesting people lined up who I need to kind of try and catch on. Skype now. I have my new little office here uh, in my new apartment. So I hope you enjoyed the episode and um, I hope I'll see you at a camp. And if not, um, I'll see you uh, somewhere else, some somewhere in the world, on or off the mats. It was really nice to be back and do the podcast after this uh, little break. So um, I hope you have a really nice day. And that was it for me. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>